I've been asked to talk to you about the importance of networking. Just firstly, a personal note. When I got involved in chairing the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, I came to it as an academic, not as a social activist, not even as somebody who would describe himself as a policy person, never having been involved in government, I came as an academic, one who was concerned about the generation of knowledge. But when we began the commission and talking to people at WHO and others, it seemed to us of vital importance that we think about what would happen at the end of it. Ownership seemed to be very important. We tried to promote ownership amongst WHO staff. The idea that this wasn't some alien beast coming along and that would produce a report and then go away again and they were expected to do something with it. And the expectation was if we behaved like that, WHO staff would do nothing with it. But also ownership on the part of the global community. So we did at least three things to try and address that. One was to try and bring WHO staff with us. And I talked to open communities of WHO staff at various points along the way in Geneva and also at several of the regional offices. I reported back when we were part way through to get discussion and I reported at the end uh, to a very interested, active and engaged audience of WHO staff. The second thing that we did was trying to engage a small number of partner countries. And this turned out to be of absolutely vital importance. Brazil, Chile, the United Kingdom, parts of Sweden, Canada, Sri Lanka, were all very important in the process of doing the commission and indeed getting the uptake after we reported. And as one example, as you will know, one of our recommendations that the commission made was for a world conference on social determinants of health. Brazil came forward and said, we'll host it. We think it's the right thing to do. And we had the first world conference in Brazil exactly 12 months ago with 126 member states represented. So the partner countries turned out to be very important. The same when I was doing my English review. We partnered with cities and regions of England and they became great advocates. But the other important thing about the partner countries is that the whole issue of social determinants of health veers on the one hand between people think, well, this is so obvious, it's just common sense. And on the other, between saying, what's this got to do with me? I work in the healthcare sector, and so why should I bother about it? Or I work in transport or in education, so why should I bother about health? So it's a bit dangerous. People either dismiss it because it's common sense or tend to have a tendency to, di to dismiss it because it's dangerous. The fact that other countries are taking it seriously, other cities are taking it seriously, is really helpful. As I go around and network, I can say, look what Brazil is doing. Look what the city of London is doing. Look what Norway is doing. We can use these examples. And the networking is really very reassuring. One has to be careful. I spoke at the annual meeting of the Canadian Medical Association. And the Canadian Medical Association doctors actively engaged with the issue of what they could be doing on social determinants of health. 
when I was talking to the American Medical Association, I didn't know whether mentioning the Canadians would be an encouragement, an inducement, or a discouragement. But indeed, the fact that the Canadians are doing it means that this is not dangerous for a medical association to take this on board. And indeed, uh, some of my colleagues in the American Medical Association are giving deep thought to what the AMA could do. And we have other medical associations in other parts of the world considering this, in India, in New Zealand, for example. And the third thing that we did was we convened knowledge networks. Now initially, what was going through my mind at least was that the purpose of the knowledge networks was to bring knowledge together. And indeed, it was, and so it proved. But they served another function. We said right at the beginning, we wanted to create a social movement. And the knowledge networks of the Commission, nine knowledge networks, scores if not hundreds of people involved in those nine knowledge networks, became part of the social movement. They became advocates for change. Wherever I go in the world, somebody will come up to me and say, I was part of your knowledge network on urban settings. I was part of your knowledge network on employment and working conditions. I was part of your gender equity knowledge network. And look what we did. We're so proud of what we did. So our knowledge networks became advocates and became part of the social movement. And we did something similar with the English Review. We had nine task groups, scores of people involved. We would have meetings with 80 or 90 people in the room, and they were real advocates. This was their review. They could see their fingerprints all over it. Hey, we did this. We own it. It's our knowledge that got synthesized. It's our wisdom that the commissioners took on board. So they could see that it was their review. They could see how they contributed. And they, they then became advocates. And so what I find as I go around, that far from people saying either, oh, this is just common sense or it's too dangerous, people are saying, we've got understanding here. We've got knowledge. And we've got a social commitment to doing things differently, to taking whole of government approaches, to looking at how all the sectors impact on health. And it's not so dangerous for us because we can learn from what they're doing in other countries. Last week, I was in Chicago and in southern Sweden. And in southern Sweden, there was a network of representatives from local authorities from all over Sweden. 25 people representing, as far as I was aware, 25 different local government areas in Sweden. The fact that they have a network helps them work together. I will be next month addressing a similar network in Norway. And the networking actually lends support, shares information, advocates become advocates for change. Sometimes the action can be at the central government level. And in Norway, indeed, the central government is really interested. In Sweden, currently, the central government has been less interested, but local government is really interested. When I was in Peru, I met the city authorities in Lima. We met some of the central government people, but we're hopeful that there'll be action at the city level. So it could happen at different levels, but the networking's absolutely vital. Now, of course, the knowledge networks had their prime purpose, which was to generate knowledge, to bring knowledge together to synthesize it, to tell us what is likely to work. And there, it was very important 
to be a little more open-minded than hitherto I had been about what constitutes knowledge. We had, in the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, in my English review, and now in the review we're about to publish in Europe, the European Review of Social Determinants of Health and the Health Divide, we had case studies, experiences from the field. Very few randomized controlled trials made up our knowledge. Yes, of course, there was quantitative information, but a lot of experience from the field, which is also of extreme importance. If we want mutual learning, if we want to translate findings into action, if we want to have a comparable system of monitoring and evaluation across countries and across jurisdictions within countries, and indeed if we want to have a social movement to advance the cause of health equity through action on the social determinants of health, then creating and fostering networks is of absolutely vital importance.